Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly webinar series. Today, we are taking up the recent uh, Supreme Court judgments and uh, some very, very important inferences that have been drawn in these judgments that we will discuss with all of you today. Over to Anil, sir. Thank you, Ankit. And uh, welcome to 88th episode of AAA weekly webinar series. What we do, we try to find out a, a new subject, any new regulation, any new uh, event. Whenever there is nothing like that, then we also see the Supreme Court judgments and High Court judgments and NCLAT judgments. So the all this is a continuous work. And the moment we feel that there is no other important subject which is prevailing, then we come to the Supreme Court judgment. In fact, uh, this becomes then the most important webinar because the, most of the people are interested to get the uh, clear understanding of the recent Supreme Court and NCLT judgments. Therefore, we find that this uh, webinar or any episode where the Supreme Court judgments or NCLAT judgments or High Court judgments are being deliberated, our attendance is normally very high. So thank you very much for the uh, giving us motivation. We are uh, now presenting our uh, today's deliberations on the Supreme Court and NCLAT judgments. Just sharing my screen. Uh, friends, uh, we'll start with the uh, judgments from Honorable Supreme Court of India. And the first thing that we actually will have uh, is the, uh, this, the judgment is Hari Babu Thotta. It is in the case of uh, uh, Shri Ashraya Infracon Limited, which is the corporate debtor. And this is the judgment from uh, Justice Sanjay Kaul, Sanjay Krishan Kaul, and Justice Sudanshu Dulia. So this is this judgment is actually very important for MSME entities. Anywhere the MSME entity, now the Supreme Court has held it that this is their right that they can participate into the resolution process. The promoters can participate into the resolution and they can submit a resolution plan irrespective of the fact whether the MSME registration was earlier there or not. However, the MSME registration is required. Now, the MSME registration can be done by the RP. MSME registration can be done by the promoters on the, on the advice of the RP. So that is where the NCLAT judgment is completely turned around and the uh, way is now totally opened that the Supreme Court has finally held. MSME is the, the objective of the Section 240 capital A was to give them an opportunity and we should not find kind of name excuses where we are actually keeping them away from the resolution. The original objective was that these are MSME where the most of the business acumen and the specialization and the experience lies with the management of the company, means the directors of the company. The In case the outsiders are not comfortable because see, this is a specific business which is a more uh, kind of depending upon the management who are suspended management in case the outsiders are not comfortable then the company will go into liquidation therefore the supreme court has very clearly held that the it is the right of the promoters to participate in msme insolvency processes so in this case the let us try to understand the facts of the case the uh, the resolution professional has actually filed this application before filed this appeal before honorable supreme court in this case <clears throat> the, this is <clears throat> Ashraya Infacon Limited is the corporate debtor and the corporate debtor got registered under MSME uh, on the advice of the RP and the registration was signed by the promoters, directors. The application for 
registration as MSME was signed by the promoter directors on the advice of the RP. <clears throat> when the resolution plan was received and the affidavit under section 29A was also received, the RP placed that resolution plan before the COC. Then the, uh, uh, the COC also approved the resolution plan and NCLT, Bangalore bench, in fact, uh, dismissed the application saying that the promoters could not have presented the plan because they are not eligible under section 29 capital A. Then the RP approached NCLT, NCLAT, whereby the Honorable NCLT in fact dismissing the observed that the resolution applicant registered as an MSME only after the initiation of CIRP. So the only argument against this resolution plan was that the MSME registration was done after the CIRP commenced. Now, in this case, uh, in fact, NCL, N, NCLT, NCLAT relied upon their earlier judgment, which is in the case of Digambar Anand Rao Pingal versus Shri Kant Madan Lal Jawar, and that was given by NCLT in 20, uh, 2021. In that judgment, in fact, it was held that the MSME uh, the, the tribunal observed that the application for MSME was made after the commencement of CIRP. So that judgment was applied. So the RP, in fact, RP filed this appeal. RP filed this appeal before Supreme Court saying that it has a very far-reaching consequences on him and his role as RP and his credibility. Because see, as you understand that in case a resolution plan is rejected on technical grounds, the adjudicating authority will not appoint that particular insolvency professional as liquidator who, who was running the CIRP. So therefore, he has the cause of action. He actually is an aggrieved party. So therefore, RP went for an appeal. So in this case, the the, the there was no respondent when there was no respondent so even the the see like even the resolution applicant was not the respondent so therefore the supreme court in fact appointed amicus curry for resolving this issue and therefore the contentions which was made by the appellant the appellant means the rp made a contention that the resolution applicant, that is the promoter, does not disqualify under the primary conditions as specified in Section 29A. Therefore, even if the MSME status provided to corporate debtor is not valid, the resolution applicant are not barred under any provisions of Section 29A. The again, the amicus query, uh, uh, amicus query also helped while. Uh, Presenting before the Supreme Court, the Ars Arsler Mittal India Private Limited versus Tish Kumar Gupta, where it was held that the opening words of Section 29A state, a person shall not be eligible to submit a resolution plan. It is clear, therefore, that the stage of ineligibility attaches when the resolution plan is submitted by a resolution applicant. However, in 2018, there was an amendment also in Section 29A, and that amendment, in fact, said clarified rather at the time of submission of the resolution plan so the supreme court said that the even the original law said the same thing so this 2018 amendment also is a clarificatory therefore the law is very clear that as on the date of submission of resolution plan there should not be any ineligibility under section 29a so when the msme a registration was applied after the commencement of CIRP, but it was available as on the date of submission of resolution plan. Therefore, Section 29A is fully complied with and the promoters are being MSME organization, being MSME entity, the promoters are exempted from Clause C and Clause H of 29A. So this was the <coughs> judgment even the amicus query also referred to the judgment of Swiss Ribbon Private Limited, where the Honorable Supreme Court has said that 
excluding such industries from disqualification under 29A clause C and H is because qua such industries other resolution applicants may not be forthcoming which thus would inevitably lead not to resolution but to liquidation that was also presented before the uh, honorable supreme court by the amicus curry then of course the section 240 capital a was defined it was presented before the honorable supreme court and the after that the uh, interplay between section 29a and section 240a was also discussed because see this section 240a also begins with notwithstanding clause that is non obstante clause so that was also presented before the honorable supreme court <clears throat> so then in in all this scenario the bench considered the judgment of digambar anand rao pingle versus shrikant madanlal jawar where the application for an msme certificate was made after the commencement of cirp and it was opined that such an unauthorized application cannot be considered and cannot be tied over the eligibility ineligibility under section 29a now the interpretation of section 240a hinges on the crucial date of bid application particularly in the assumption for msme unlike other aspects where the intimation of cirp proceedings could serve as the cut off date section 240a operates differently this distinction is rooted in the statement made by the minister while introducing the amendment bill the inclination to accept the argument that in protecting these specific industries disqualification should not be incurred notably due to presence of notwithstanding clause therefore the final order what was given by the uh, honorable supreme court that the plan submitted in question will not incur the disqualification we may also note that the aforesaid intent is reflected in the statutory provision itself that in section 29a clause c which begins with at the time of submission of resolution plan so at the time of submission of resolution plan it was very clear that the company is msme and it is duly registered it was it is also pointed out that even if it was NPA. The fact the defect can be cured as set out in proviso before the submission of plan, making the submission of the plan the crucial date. So the crucial date is the submission of plan. Therefore, the order of NCLT and NCLT was uh, quashed, and the resolution plan was approved. So okay, this was the resolution. This was the first important judgment having a lot of uh, impact on the insolvency resolution of msme even if someone is not msme registered so they in fact because of this ncl 80 judgment the resolution professionals were making most of the applications from the promoters as ineligible under section 29a so would you like to add uh, anything on it i'm adding something that was going on in one of the ibc groups and uh that what were the conversation that was happening was that after CRP has started, the suspended management would not have the power to apply for an MSME registration. So can the RP with permission of the COC apply for an MSME registration for a company and allow the promoters to become eligible after the CRP commences? That is a question which is very important because many COC members might say that it is good to have another option from the promoters to come out with the resolution plan and they would want that competition to uh, be there in case the company is eligible to be an MSME after the CRP date or on the date of on which the RP wants to apply for MSME registration. So, uh, but I think, Ankit, first of all, uh, this particular application does not require any COC approval. Because see, the, even the RP is otherwise also uh, responsible for all the compliances. Present compliances uh, uh, is, uh, requirement says that if a company is having a turnover of less than 250 crores and investment in fixed assets is less than 50 crores in the last year, that means they, they need to do the MSME registration. And in case any company has not done it, after the amendment 
then it is the duty of the RP to do that. Now, the question is that in, in some cases, the MSME registration portal, the uh, online portal may not accept the signatures of the RP because of the technical issues. So, in that case, the RP may even direct the suspended management to make that application and to sign that application. That also is valid. In fact, the case that we have just deliberated, that case also is like this, that the suspended management has applied. However, they made an application on the advice of the RP. So this is also in, in this particular case. Now, this will really help a lot of uh, MSME promoters be part of the resolution process and it will genuinely uh, you know, affect the resolution plan value for many cases. I think there are some questions or there are some people who have raised hands. I could see uh, one or two people, in fact, raising hands. Uh, uh, I think I'm not a co-host right now, so I'm not able to ask them to speak. Okay, so there are attendees. And I can even, Jitendra Paliwal is asking some question. Uh, so I think uh, Jitendra Paliwal can ask a question like in case I have, uh, you need to unmute yourself and ask this question. So, sir, should we uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, if a uh, CD has uh, um, uh, got the MSME certificate uh, uh, after start of the CIP, then uh, as on today, uh, can we uh, can we consider that he can uh, apply for a resolution plan? Certainly, he... certainly. This is what is the uh, judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court, and it very clearly clarified that the unit, the entity is MSME, based on the definition which is given in Section Seven of MSME Act. If that Section Seven conditions are complied with then the application can be submitted by the suspended management, it can be submitted by the RP <clears throat> as the case may be, because the maybe technical difficulties are that this uh, Udyam portal may not accept RP. So therefore, in this case, RP advised uh, to the suspended management that you make an application. So that is uh, upheld by the Honorable Supreme Court. You are absolutely right. That would be the case now. But isn't that 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 the uh, question will again, you know, uh, raise that uh, that the uh, same companies are getting backdoor entry? No, see, that is what is the intent of the giving this exemption under Section Two Forty uh, A. When this exemption was given, the minister uh, made a statement that in MSME, uh, the as I also have said, have said just in in a smaller organization, the business is normally run based on the one, sometimes contracts, sometimes their capabilities, sometimes their kind of alignment with the customers. So that may not be possible for some outsider to come and run that business. So in case there is nobody outsider who actually can be, uh, who is offering a better uh, price, then the company will go into liquidation, which is not required. So the basically IBC is for resolving the cases. So that is what is the intent that the promoter should come and the promoter should give the price which is either otherwise the public is giving the market is giving the market price should be given by the promoters and they they they, they can get their company back okay sir thank you thanks a lot i think mr vike gupta is also asking he is also raising hands so i think we mr vike gupta in case he would like to speak please unmute yourself yes sir my question, I mean, against against the last is the questions raised by the learned person that why it should not be allowed actually, because you see, as you have already rightly said that the purpose of the CIRP is to find out a resolution, and yes. second yes. position is that we should give the maximization of the value of the assets. So right. when the th these two things are getting fulfilled by allowing the MSME promoters, then it is more beneficial because there is no bar on the other RAs to bid for it. He is only going to be one of the RAs. So I think this is a very good order now that MSME's promoters, because MSME promoters, as you have already rightly pointed out, that uh, this is a very peculiar situation in every enterprise, which only the current promoter is knowing about it. They know very well that what is to be done, 
how the business is to be run. This is not unlike the big businesses where there is a, some set of standards. So I think this is a very good decision taken by the court based on certain parameters that it is in the right spirit of the IBC. It gives the max value maximization and otherwise it will lead into the liquidation. So it's a very good uh, order, I would say. Certainly, certainly. So I think what you are saying is you are trying to say like whatever this order is absolutely most welcome. The order is a welcome play, uh, order. So I think that's in fact uh, uh, all of us are saying the same. But now I, I believe we also have to give an opportunity to Bisani Anu. And uh, the Bisani Anu is uh, also, I, I think he is also interested in saying something. But I would only request that if you have something, some follow-on question, then you should uh, raise hand. I would be uh, I would be interested in replying to your questions in case uh, uh, you have a question. Yes, please. You can unmute yourself. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank good you morning. for your sessions. It's wonderful to listen to you every Saturday morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, my, I there is no question, but I just wanted to add something to what is the discussion going on. See, yeah. when we are telling about MSME status being given to the company, is it beneficial for the promoters? We should also understand it is not only for promoters, it is for open for every other person who is eligible to participate, even if he's an M uh, NPA, because the CD is uh, MSME. So the I benefit think, uh, is not I think only for uh, the promoter. Uh, this is very important. Uh, what uh, 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 see, like Bisani Anu is saying, what he is saying is that it is not only that the clause C and clause H is is exempted. It is not the exemption only for the promoters. Right, Even sir. any other person, any other person who has no relationship with the company, and if he is not still in is if he is not still eligible under clause C and clause H, still he can participate. So I'm so I feel that this clarification was important. So uh, thank you very much because see the 29A is not only for promoters and section 240A is not only for board motors, it is for resolving a MSME. Resolving an MSME, giving opportunities to others also, even if they have some difficulty. Even if they have some difficulty. So basically the objective was that if there is a uh, any, any person who actually have interest in that company, even if they are having some financial difficulty, they can still come and participate in MSME resolution process. So, Ankit, should we go ahead? Yes, I think we should do that, yeah. Okay, so uh, now we go on to another important judgment, which is in the case of IFCI Limited versus Sutanu Sinha. And in this case, the corporate debtor was IBRCL Changapalli Tollways Limited. This is again from Honorable Supreme Court. It was delivered on 9th of November 2023. It was again given by... Justice Sanjay Kishan Call and Mr. Justice Asanuddin Amandula. Now, in this case, it is a case of debentures. Now, there are uh, debentures, which is basically a vanilla uh, debentures. So, these debentures, which was actually issued to IFCI by the uh, company, it was the compulsory, com compulsory convertible debentures. Of course, it was carrying an interest rate also, but it was compulsory convertible. So now the IBC says that the debentures are financial debt. And even section 71, subsection 1 of the Companies Act, it says, it says that the an option is provided to the company to issue debentures with a convertible option of debentures into share during redemption. Such debentures are called convert, con compulsory convertible debentures or even optionally convertible debentures in some cases. So, but this particular case is for compulsory convertible debentures. The, the, these debentures are instruments that are issued by the companies at a fixed rate of interest and that are mandatorily convertible into equity at a specified at, at a specific time period. Now, in this particular case, the specific time period even has not reached. The specific time period has not even reached. So, therefore, what we are trying to now say, 
when the specific time period is not raised, that is not uh, uh, even. So let us try to see um, the. In most of the toll projects, a concession agreement is executed between the company and National Highway Authority of India. So in that concession agreement, there is a project report and in the project report, which is some part is the debt part, some part is an equity part. So this compulsorily convertible debentures were in fact part of the equity in that project report because this is convertible into equity and was not supposed to be redeemed. It was about 125 crore. When this company, this IVRCL, Changapali Tollways, in fact, in fact, it came into IBC, IFCI, in fact, uh, filed their claim as financial debt. RP rejected that. IFCI approached NCLAT and NCLAT also rejected the app appeal. Therefore, the Supreme Court. Now, in this case, the appellant means IFCI pleaded before Honorable Supreme Court that the investment of the appellant is treated as equity and not debt, then the appellant has left with no remedies. That is what IFCI said. Even after the majority date of the CCD, the investment of the appellant was really treated as debt on account of the financial difficulty. Because see, the majority date came, the company was in financial difficulty, it was not converted into equity, so it is still a debenture. The conversion of a CCD to equity actually became impossible due to the insolvency of the company. That is also one of the arguments. See, the IFSA could not convert into equity, convert this into equity because of the insolvency. Now, the respondent, the respondent means the RP says that the concessionaire agreement with NHI, wherein the equity is defined as sum expressed in Indian rupee representing the paid up equity share capital of the concessionaire for meeting the equity component of the total project cost and shall include convertible instruments or any other similar instrument. The concept of convertible instrument including CCD falls into the definition of equity. So it is very simpliciter debenture. If it was a simpliciter vanilla debenture, it would have fallen in the category of the financial debt along with the bonds, etc. However, the present case concerns CCD with liability of coupon payment, buyback and security being the sponsors, failing which the CCD were to automatically convert into equity. That is what the RP said. The financing plan of the respondent itself envisaged CCD as part of the equity portion. So therefore, the company does not have a liability or obligation towards the appellant because the appellant is actually an equity participation and does not have a debt to be paid. Now, let us understand what the uh, company says. Now, the you know, what the Supreme Court says. Supreme Court in this case said that the IFCA was providing security under that concessionaire agreement but the obligation were always of the sponsor, that is IVRCL and not of the corporate debtor, unless the debt is proven to be the uh, proven to be of ICTL, IFCI cannot seek a recovery of the amount assuming the position of a creditor. The Apex Court also observed that IFC has not disputed that the put option available to it was not exercised. Therefore, the Supreme Court says, the definition of debt under section 3, subsection 11 was also discussed and the court upheld the NCLT's decision stating that the issue has been correctly crystallized as to whether CCD would be treated as debt instead of an equity instrument and that decision that treating the CCD as debt would be tantamount to breach of common loan agreement and especially the concession agreement which has an overriding effect. It held that the investment was clearly in the nature of debenture, which were compulsory convertible into e equity. There was no provision stating that these CCD would partake the character of financial debt on happening of a particular event. So the, therefore, the court dismissed. But one thing that the court clarified, that the section 62, even in case we read section 62, it is said that the Supreme Court should the jurisdiction of the, the Supreme Court, rather the right of filing an appeal 
before Supreme Court should be confined to a question of law. And the Supreme Court actually should not be given the job of like kind of uh, scrutiny of every event or every document. But that is what is finally mentioned by the way by the uh, uh, Honorable Supreme Court that the Supreme Court should actually be approached only when there is a question of law. Anything that you would like to add, Ankit? No, I think this is fair that uh, CCDs, uh, compulsory convertible debentures, uh, you know, a tool used by many investors so that they have a liquidation preference. And earlier it used to be preferences, but debt debentures, I think, it has been used now. One, to bypass the requirements of valuation under Income Tax Act. The Income Tax Act and the recent judgment has already incorporated compulsory convertible preference uh, shares, CCPS, as a shares which can be or which require valuation uh, by, a, by a merchant banker for the assessment of taxation. The CCD is still not part of that. It can be still required to be valued, but it is the more open on how the valuation can be done. Uh, but in this, with respect to IBC framework, I think it's perfectly okay that any dilution, uh, dilution, uh, a, a dilution of equity or dilution of uh, dilutable equity rights should be taken care of as equity only. So moving on to the third judgment, which is Ram, Ram Krishna Forging Limited versus Ravindra Lunkar, the resolution professional of ACIL Limited. ACIL Limited is the a corporate data. This judgment was given on 21st of November 2023 by Justice Vikram Nath and Justice Ashanuddin Amanullah. So in this case, again, once again, the power of the Committee of Creditor for Approval of Resolution Plan has actually been fortified and confirmed. Now, in this case, the uh, like the, uh, the when the CIRP was started, IDBI in fact filed the application. So Ramakrishna Forging Limited was the resolution applicant and various uh, like kind of revisions of the resolution plan was submitted. So finally the uh, resolution plan was for about 129 crore out of this 129 crore 84.54 was supposed to go to the financial creditor in upfront manner. Now the, uh, the resolution plan is approved by 94.25% voting. The NCLT, NCLT, in fact, kept the resolution plan in abeyance. NCLT was not approving the resolution plan. NCLT was saying that in this resolution plan, the haircut has been 94.25%. NCLT was not comfortable approving the resolution plan. So NCLT, in fact, <coughs> directed the official liquidator as we see official liquidator in respective high courts, the NCLT directed the official liquidator to revalue the assets of the company to provide the exact figures. And the, this particular process was upheld by NCLT also. So NCLT also said that yes, the NCLT can do this. So therefore, this particular appeal was filed before Honorable Supreme Court. So therefore, you know, what we are trying to say, the resolution plan was approved, haircut was 95%, the adjudicating authority was not comfortable approving it, adjudicating authority directed the official liquidator attached to high courts to revalue the assets. Now the in this uh, NCLAT also says that this is the right uh, uh, order passed by adjudicating authority, therefore the appellant Ramakrishna Forging appealed before Honorable Supreme Court and argued that the resolution plan was actually submitted uh, after extensive consideration, 11 revisions were made and finally the, uh, the, the amount offered was uh, very high and the all the statutory procedures were followed, CIC, uh, COC approved this, there is no jurisdiction that the uh, NCLT should exercise over the uh, commercial wisdom of the COC. There was no occasion for the NCLT to embark on alien, alien procedure, alien procedure which is not even provided in the law, that alien procedure was in fact 
resorted to by NCLT and the official liquidator is supposed to involve what is the expertise of an official liquidator. It was also held that the valuers are appointed under regulation 35 of the CIRP regulations and they have to value the assets as per the regulations, as per the regulated processes. Also, it was argued that the, in the case of Maharashtra Seamless Limited versus Padwan Aban Venkatesh, it was held by Honorable Supreme Court that as far as this valuation process is concerned, valuation process is only for the purpose of assisting the COC and the valuation is, cannot be like uh, questioned. Therefore, the official, it was also argued that the official liquidator is, uh, is an entity, it, it's created by the company's law and it is not a kind of uh, having any kind of uh, uh, presence in the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So, in this case, the, solic the assistant of the Solicitor General of India also argued and argued in the manner that the NCLT have no jurisdiction to sit on appeal over commercial wisdom of the COC and interference would be warranted only when the NCLT or NCLAT find a non-adherence to the code or regulations. Even in the case of Arun Kumar Jagat Ramka versus Jindal Steel and Power Limited, it was held by Honorable Supreme Court that need for judicial intervention or innovation from NCLT and NCLT should be kept at its bare minimum and should not disturb the fundamental principles of the code. It was also argued by the respondent, uh, it, it was also argued by the uh, rather appellant that the Committee of Creditors of SRST Limited, it has been observed that the harmonious reading of section 31 subsection 1, section 60 subsection 5 of the code would lead to a result that the residual jurisdiction of the NCLT under these sections, uh, it is only by, uh, there is hardly anything that we can say that the discretionary or equity jurisdiction is not there. When it comes to resolution plan, when it comes to resolution plan, it is not, it, it is actually, they cannot keep it pending for all these uh, reasons. Then it was also said that with regard to the impact of pendency of avoidance like it was also argued that the pendency of avoidance applications on the approval of the resolution no what was the again argument like in case 95 percent is the haircut then most of the other part would have been covered under the avoidance transactions application filed by the rp so therefore the it was also mentioned in the resolution plan that any benefit any recovery out of the avoidance transaction that will also go to the financial creditors. So that was also argued. So the, in fact, the Supreme Court of India, in fact, used their own decisions, various decisions, like in the case of K. Shashidhar versus Indian Overseas Bank. Uh, this was given in 2019. Then Committee of Creditors of SR Steel India Limited versus Tish Kumar Gupta 2020. Maharashtra Seamless Limited, Kalp, uh, Kalparaj, Dharmashi versus Kotak Investment Advisors Limited 2021, Pratap Technocrats Private Limited versus Monitoring Committee of Reliance Infratech Limited in 2021, and observed that COC decision is not to be subjected to unnecessary judicial scrutiny and intervention. Ordering for revaluation of the asset by the official liquidator was not justified. Therefore, the COC is the decision making. The COC is the decision making make, decision maker, and in the driver seat. So to say, the uh, as far as the as far as the corporate data is concerned, the COC is the in the driving seat. So the court observed that there may have been a situation where, due to glaring facts, an order could be left untouched, but only if detailed reasoning disclosing the facts for being persuaded to embark on such path were discernible in such orders. The order in this case unfortunately was cryptive and bereft of details. It was like kind of the, 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 it was not the basic intent of the adjudicating authority was cryptive and the details were not provided. The detailed thought process was not provided. It was bereft of the details. It was further observed that the NCLT and NCLAT add in fully recognize and to fully recognize that under the resolution plan, 
the CD was set to be revived and not liquidated. Thus, the minimum mandatory component in the resolution plan was only a reflection of actual money, including upfront money. The Supreme Court also emphasized the importance of importance of reasoned order and observed that regarding reasons and not just reasons but cogent reasons for order is duly the uh, to all the courts and tribunals. This is also by way of a passing reference, the Supreme Court has also given this observation. So, Ankit, in this case, the one that the, uh, the Supreme Court has almost, in their own words, have directed the adjudicating authority and the appellate authority to give a reasoned order. And it, the order should not be cryptic. And also, the kind of the appointment of official liquidator was not a good decision. So, leave, uh, you can add, uh, but this is the third order of the Supreme Court that we could find, which was important. Now, this is a very good order, and I think there are multiple orders previously also, which kind of talk about the same thing. And it's very, very important to bring these orders to the attention of the NCLD and NCLAT in case they are deciding the resolution plan. And even yesterday, there was a hearing before NCLT Jaipur where I'm the RP talking about approval of a resolution plan. There again, uh, uh, the you know uh, the, the 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 contesting parties to the resolution plan raise frivolous grounds based on which they try to say that the resolution plan is not as per law, this that. So the answer uh, with respect to how the NCLT should limit its domain is very very important for the NCLT to record in the order and as well as you know kind of take into consideration when they are hearing all those objections which kind of are misdirected. So now we move on to NCL, NCL 80 judgments and the judgment that we have in front of us has actually, is, it was delivered on 5th of uh, December. So in fact, a very, very latest because today we are talking, we are on, we are on 16th of uh, December 2023 and this judgment was delivered on 5th of December 2023. So I would actually say thanks to my uh, uh, legal team that they actually could get all these orders and they also analyzed it. So this is also a very interesting judgment from NCL 80 where an RP is challenging the uh, resolution passed by COC uh, where they have decided to replace the IRP with another insolvency professional. The, uh, the in, in this particular case, the uh, State Bank of India, in fact, when this IRP was appointed, State Bank of India asked the RP to convene a meeting and also told the IRP that they have an intent of changing the insolvency professional and they would keep another insolvency professional as IRP or RP in this case. So the IRP did not convene the meeting. Therefore, the application was filed by the State Bank of India directly under Rule 11 of NCLT rules. In the meantime, in the meantime, the IRP filed a contempt application before NCLT saying that in the order it was very clearly written that rupees 5 lakhs is supposed to be paid by the applicant bank and that has not been paid to the IRP. And in fact, in that particular case, in the contempt case, the NCLT also issued notice to the managing director of the appellant bank. Thus, in, see, however, in the meeting of the COC, when the meeting was conducted and then the resolution was passed, and by that time, by that time, some like substantial period, in fact, had uh, lapsed and the CIRP expenditures of 76 lakhs were, in fact, incurred by the IRP. Now, those expenditures were not paid by the banks, even that 5 lakhs of rupees were not paid by the bank. However, in this case, the COC dissented on approval of the CIRP cost. The adjudicating authority confirmed the replacement of IRP as per the decision of the COC. Therefore, the IRP approached NCLAT challenging the replacement of the RP. Now, the contentions of the appellant was that the order allowing the replacement is alleged to have been issued in breach of natural justice as it failed to consider the submissions of the IRP. 
the order lacked a detailed explanation, was hastily issued, and violates Section 22 and 27 of the IBC, as the decision to replace the RP should have been made only after hearing the RP's submissions and adjudicating the raise issues. Now, the respondent means the State Bank of India says that this resolution was passed with 100% voting. This appeal is not maintainable. The RP has been avoiding appearing before the adjudicating authority, leading to passing the leading to passing the order for convening the meeting. In pursuance of the order, the resolution for the replacement of IRP was passed with 100% voting, and it was also submitted by the bank that the RP, uh, uh, the, the submitted of the RP without informing the COC started visiting the plants of the corporate debtor and entered MOU without any information and approval of the COC. RP has thoroughly misconducted himself and has been making allegations on the COC. NCL 80 finally, let us see what NCL 80 says. NCL 80 says that the Appointment of IRP was never confirmed by the COC, nor any material has been brought on record to indicate that the appointment of IRP was confirmed by COC by a majority of not less than 66%. When the IRP appointment has not been confirmed, the IRP could not have replaced by the COC under Section 22, could not, could not have been replaced by the COC under Section 22. The mere fact that the resolution which was placed before e-voting, there was an alternate resolution both under section 22 and 27 cannot be read to mean that there is any infirmity in the resolution passed for uh, replacement by 100%. So the judgment in the case of Sumant Kumar Gupta versus COC Messrs. Ballap Textiles Company Limited, it was held by Honorable NCLT that NCLT fully support the submissions of the respondent when the a resolution has been passed by the COC in accordance with the provisions of the IBC deciding to replace the IRP. IRP cannot be heard in questioning the resolution on the ground that present was not a case where the IRP could have been replaced by another resolution professional. In such circumstances, the Honorable NCLT held the order passed by Honorable NCLT and allowed the allowing the replacement. So this was the order, Ankit, regarding the replacement of IRP. So we can say that the powers of the COC is unchallenged to replace IRP with any other person. Not even required that the COC should give reasons. I believe not even required that the COC should give an opportunity to the uh, outgoing IRP uh, and also give justification to the outgoing IRP. So that also is not required. This is a very important judgment. And uh, again, with respect to CRP cost, I would like to add that in case you have 74 lakhs of CRP cost incurred without the approval of the COC, that again, there are so many judgments now that CRP cost has to be approved by them. And uh, I also think that in, even in case you're not having a COC meeting and not getting the expense approved before incurring the expense, it's always a good practice to either informally or formally seek the approval of the uh, creditors on an expense that you're planning to make so that it can be ratified later rather than, you know, suffering from the informality that it is never paid to those people who have actually done that work or incurred that expense. Yes, Sankit. So what we are trying to say now is the thing, and we are now, <clears throat> now going forward again, a judgment from Justice Ashok Bhushan and, in the, and, and Mr. Barun Mitra and Arun Boraka. This is a three bench, three member judgment. Whether the inclusion of a condition mandatory, uh, mandating the submission of a bank guarantee along with the along with the a resolution plan in RFRP contradict CIRP regulation. So in this case, the basic uh, issue which was raised <clears throat> by then by the applicant that was slightly uh, a very kind of. Uh, now the in this case the in a resolution process uh, 50 lakhs was the amount which was kept for submission of expression of interest as per the rfrp and the one person who actually wanted to participate into the resolution process and he said that he cannot deposit 50 lakhs of rupees so he did not deposit the 50 lakhs of rupees in the meantime, 
the other people participated and the resolution plan was also approved and it was also kind of implemented or it was in the process of implementing. However, that person who whose request for waiving this 50 lakhs or who, whose request that this 50 lakhs is unlawful, that person in fact had gone to adjudicating authority and then filed an appeal. He was challenging that CIRP regulation 36 capital B sub regulation 4, it only provides for request of resolution plan shall not require any non-refundable deposit. So in RFRP, there is no such clause which requires that the resolution applicant has to submit any non-refundable deposit. So in this case, it was only the bank guarantee which was required. Or if somebody doesn't have a bank guarantee, then the amount would be deposited uh, through the banking channels. Now, in this case, the in fact, the appellant also had made a request to COC to waive that requirement of bank guarantee and he wanted to participate. And however, the COC declined that and then he went to the uh, uh, he went to the appeal. So when he uh, went to the appeal, so it was decided by the uh, Honorable uh, NCL 80 that there is uh, uh, nothing unlawful to ask for the earnest money deposit, which is refundable as along with the submission of the EOI as mentioned in RFRP. In the meantime, the resolution plan was also approved and the uh, it was also implemented. So therefore, that is also something which is not, uh, so it be particular uh, uh, infructuous. This application becomes infructuous. However, it was also clarified by NCLT that it is only to, uh, the purpose of this earnest money deposit is only to invite serious resolution applicants and not any anyone who is having some time. So this, this judgment is also, because see, we were also very clear that it is the requirement. So it is also something which is uh, clarificatory now that the NCL 80 also says that you can ask for earnest money deposit along with the submission of expression of interest. Yes, Ankit. No, I think it's uh, pretty clear that this clarification has come in. Uh, I see that uh, uh, this this can be used wherever you know this process is challenged by somebody. Okay, so we move on to the couple of more judgments quickly. For Vent Sunarji's Limited versus Manish Jaju, the RP and the others. Again, the judgment from NCL 80 Delhi and the judgment was given on 2nd of November 2023. Whether the doctrine of promissory estoppel can be pressed in respect of a resolution plan under IPC. So I will just give you the briefly. So in this case, LIC Housing Finance Limited in fact sanctioned a term loan of 130 crore and Sivana Reality, Sivana Reality Private Limited whereby the Samriddhi Garden project of the CD was mortgaged to LIC Housing Finance. In this case, the basic condition of the loan was that whenever the company will create a third party right or sell any unit, the uh, company will seek NOC from LIC. So the company in fact continued with this process and some of the allotments were done without taking NOC and some of the allotments were done with the taking NOC. So the, when this uh, uh, RP received the claim, so RP in fact made two categories of the claimants, one category of those uh, how, how those allottees who have the NOC from the LIC and one category is of the those allottees who does not have the NOC from LIC and the when the CIRP started everyone filed their claims so RP first of all said that the, your claim is cannot be admitted then later on the RP admitted the claim so now RP has admitted the claim of both parties both kind of allottees one one kind, one category is that they have NOC from the LIC and the other, other category is that they don't have the NOC from LIC. In the resolution plan, there was the, the different treatment was given to those who, who have NOC and the different treatment, rather some inferior treatment was given to those who did not have the NOC from the LIC. So the basic contentions were that the basic contention in this case was that the RP has actually uh, approved the claim as a lottie. 
once the rp has actually approved a claim then the differential treatment is not possible because the the approving a claim is a promise so therefore the promissory estoppel uh, the concept of the law that should be applicable here that the promise whatever promise has been done by the rp that should be enforceable so promissory estoppel in such cases also it is not something that it has to be rp it because the court says that the filing a claim is a separate process Ad admitting a claim is a separate process and filing a resolution plan is a separate process resolution plan has been approved by the committee of creditors so it is being implemented so we have nothing to say that the rp had promised him as an allottee therefore he actually should get the same rights as the other allottees then we also have another this is something which is again like i am just going quickly now because the time is up the now there is a dispute going on in the in the professional circles regarding the uh, obligation of a proposer of a compromise and arrangement scheme under section 230 of the companies act whether he is supposed to pay the liquidators fee or not this is a case of ca jayendra and gupta versus radha siria properties private limited delivered on 8th of december 2023 by ncl 80 new delhi the liquidator was claiming liquidator was claiming his salary from the proposer for the period that the section 230 proposal was under consideration see as per regulation 2b it is very clearly written that in case a proposal under section 230 is received and it is being and it is under consideration then the liquidator will draw the fee which was equal which would which would be equivalent to the fee of the rp so in this case the liquidator was drawing the fee equivalent to the fee of the rp but when this proposal under section 230 for compromise and arrangement under the companies act failed the committee of creditors rejected that proposal it is also written that this cost the cost liquidation cost would not be borne by the corporate debtor it would be borne by the proposer in case it is rejected however in case it is accepted then the cost will be borne by the corporate debtor that is what is written in regulation 2b now the court in fact held in this case that as far as the liquidator's salary is concerned we are not challenging that the liquidator's salary is not payable under regulation 2b of the liquidation process regulations the liquidator is entitled to his salary as per regulation 4 also what they are saying is that the salary of the liquidator is does not mean that will be paid by the proposer only the liquidation cost only the cost of processing or the process of the, the cost of entertaining that proposal under section 230 of companies act that cost can be recovered without the liquidation liquidator's fee for that period this is what another clarification which has come so i am not going into very very detailed analysis because we have a very very less time now we are also touching this amita saurab bihani and others these are all various workers in the case of eng global estate limited again a judgment given on 5th of december 2023 now in this uh, judgment the, uh, the 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 honorable nclt is saying that the this is the the responsibility of pursuing avoidance applications is on the rp it is the duty of the rp to file appropriate applications and also to which are which falls under the under section 43 45 49 50 or 66 and the statutory scheme says that it is the duty of the rp to determine the nature of such transaction and file an appropriate application before the adjudicating authority the the the, the avoidance applications are not statutorily bound by time this is also held 
you can see the OIDS applications can take some time. And section 26 of the IBC clearly stipulates that the pendency of OIDS application shall not come in way of the approval of the reservation plan. And therefore, the CIRP and the avoidance applications are by thus very nature a separate set of proceedings. Former is time bound, whereas the later requires the proper discovery of suspect transactions that are time consuming. So in this case, even this, even the uh, Honorable NCL 80 also referred to the division bench judgment of Delhi High Court in the case of Tata Steel BSL Limited versus Venus Recruiter Private Limited. If you would recall, uh, uh, dear friends, that the single bench of Delhi High Court passed an order in the case of Venus Recruiter Private Limited that the RP cannot continue and RP cannot wear the hat of former RP. And therefore, the application was in fact rejected. However, the division bench uh, again uh, uh, reversed the judgment and division bench of the same Delhi High Court in the same case in fact said that the avoidance application which are initiated by the RP shall continue irrespective of the finalization of the resolution plan and the conclusion of the CIRP. So this also kind of now the NCL80 also clarified, Delhi High Court also clarified that the RP's role will continue even after the resolution plan is approved. RP will continue to be the applicant RP will continue to be continue to pursue those applications because it is very clearly written in that app, see, a, a resolution plan also that any recovery under section 43, 45, 49, 50 or 66 that would be the exclusive right of COC. Therefore, the resolution plan was approved irrespective of the fact whether the avoidance transactions application was pending or not. So this was also one of the important judgment that the RP's obligation will continue. Now the another judgment which is like Paschimanchal Vidyut Mitran Limited uh, Nigam Limited versus HSA Trader. This is again a judgment from Justice Ashok Bhushan, the chairperson and the technical member Mr. Barun Mitra. In this case, the in the case of liquidation, the asset was sold to a successful bidder. However, when the successful bidder went to the distribution electricity distribution company, the electricity distribution company, in fact, said that they would not be energizing your electric connection because of the past dues and they were asking for the past dues. Now, it has been held various times that the successful resolution applicant or successful auction purchaser actually is not having any obligation to pay the past dues. It actually, the tribunal also, in fact, held in the case of Chinar Steel Segment Centers Private Limited versus Samir Kumar Agarwal that the successful au auction purchaser was fully, enter uh, fully entertainable under Section 60, Subsection 5, since it arose out of the liquidation proceeding. That, that was a jurisdiction issue. Whether the successful uh, buyer can also approach NCLT or not, so that was also held that the successful buyer can also approach NCLT or NCL80 under section 60 subsection 5. Now, therefore, the in this case also, the NCL80 directed the distribution company, electric distribution company to energize the connection and also, like in fact, referred many cases like Shiv Shakti, Shiv Shakti Intraglobe Exports Private Limited versus KTC Food Private Limited. It was also said that the Supreme Court has also said in the case of Tata Power Western Odisha Distribution Limited versus the uh, Jagannath Sponge Private Limited. So in all these cases, the payment is not required to be made. So the, the connection must be energized immediately. That was held. Now, the, in this case where Amit Kumar Pandey and many other workers versus Pradeep Kumar Sethi RP, that's in the case of Ram Krishna Forging Limited. In this particular case, the contractor of the workmen and the employees, in fact, filed, first of all, he filed an application, filed a claim as an operational creditor. When he filed a claim under the operational creditor, it was considered as an operational creditor as a vendor because he was a contractor and all those workers were not on the role of the company. Later, he objected to the resolution plan saying that the worker of the employees, worker of the company are given a different treatment and my, my workers 
whosoever was on my roll or they were given different work in fact the application was filed by five six workmen only not by the uh, not by the operational creditor not by the contractor however the court have finally said that in this case the claim was filed as, as an oc it was accepted as an oc the treatment of the uh, oc's claim was actually uh, considered in the resolution plan the resolution plan is approved the workman uh, is different as per the definition of the industrial dispute act and the workman is different because the workman is now uh, uh, that person is actually providing a service so the workman will not be considered as workman in this case so that is what is the judgment again so i think uh, we have uh, finished our today's uh, because see, there is uh, uh, no way that we should continue after the time if there is any comment that you would like to add you can add the comments we are up with the time so we I have handled uh, quickly seven uh, nclat judgments and three supreme court judgments in fact very clearly we see that the things are happening a lot of disputes are getting resolved uh, but then yes uh, somehow the when nowadays when we go to the uh, banks the banks are not really positive they are saying that uh, we are uh, not going ahead with the insolvency we are not filing applications to insolvency law we are trying one time settlement or we are trying surfacing so this uh, needs to be a little uh, reversed i think the uh, lawmakers should think about it that if the banks financial institutions are not comfortable with ibc uh, then uh, this is uh, really was not the objective of the law yes ankit no i think very much like i so the two problems that when when i visited bombay mangalore we visit delhi so there are some cases of course which require ibc and that ibc is the only solution to kind of restore the company so there the banks are still in for that process but wherever they feel that oh we can recover the money through other actions in a in a more quick manner in a in a quick manner rather than having ibc which can go on for years there they are hesitant to go forward and therefore the speed of ibc should improve idly that's what i believe should, is the is the required action from all the professionals so that it becomes of more of a utility for the banks even in case they feel that oh ibc may be uh, may, may be taking one year time but it is still worth the effort so great uh, good judgment today a uh, lot of clarity provided a lot of issues and uh, looking forward to see all of you next week thank you thank very you. much thank you very much and thank you for participating thanks a lot